Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the all-party parliamentary group for cycling and walking. And this afternoon, I'm absolutely delighted to be introducing my colleague and the fabulous Trudy Harrison MP, the minister who's responsible for active travel at the Department for Transport. Um, Trudy was appointed in September last year and is the Member of Parliament for Copeland and previously was the Private Parliamentary Secretary to the Prime Minister. So hopefully it's going to let us in on some of those cycling secrets from round the corner at number 10. Um, in addition on the call today, we're delighted to have Rupert Furness, who is the Deputy Director and Head of the Active Travel Division at the Department to help with the difficult questions. I understand, Rupert. Thank you very much for that. And um, so today, Trudy's going to give us an update on the Department for Travel Transport's active travel policy and there will then be an opportunity to ask questions afterwards. So I've got quite a few pre-submitted questions but if you do want to ask please can you use the Q&A function that's spelt Q and A, not the chat one. And could you keep the questions short? Because um, I, I, it's not great if I have to read out a long epic. So the question is short and pithy. And um, I am at this point going to hand over to Trudy. Thank you very much, Minister. Oh, thank you very much, Selene and Ruth. It's really um, great to be invited. It's a relatively new addition to my brief, which is predominantly the decarbonisation and future of transport covering now everything from walking and cycling, micro mobility, including electric scooters, all the way through the road vehicles, what are the solutions for battery electric vehicles, infrastructure charging, all of that, the legislation for the future of vehicles like self-driving technology, automation, and then through to heavy goods vehicles, buses, coaches, rail, maritime, aviation, and even a couple of space launches. So it's a very, very varied brief and predominantly features um, how we're going to decarbonize. It is very much about future fuels and it's absolutely encompassing the legislation that we'll need. But of course, it's not all about vehicles. So the addition to my brief fits in really well because if we are going to decarbonize and we are going to have a happier, healthier, safer society, then walking and cycling is going to play a huge part. And to be slightly more precise, the Prime Minister, who you already mentioned, Selene, is such a keen cyclist. And I think the only non-secret now that he's um, Prime Minister is that he doesn't get out on his bike anywhere near as much as he would like to. Um, but he has made that commitment that half of all short journeys in towns and cities will be walked or cycled by 2030. And sometimes we surpass that. I think one of the silver linings of the pandemic has been the appreciation, not just for the great outdoors, but also to get fitter. And with the decrease in vehicles, um, we have certainly seen an increase in cyclists. And in terms of where we're going um, now, gear change already out, fantastic policy, two billion pounds, six times more than we've ever committed. That um, puts flesh on the bones to some extent, but in terms of who is going to de be delivering this, the recent appointment of the interim chief executive of Active Travel England, Chris Boardman, has put us in a, a position where we're going to put that board together and really set out how this executive body, Active Travel England, will be involved with budgeting, with designing, with being a, a you know, really important consultee on major infrastructure and generally assisting me because um, you know, this needs to work right across the country for everyone. And it is really important that we have people who are really familiar with cycling and all of the difficulties that cyclists face. My main advisor, I'm sure Ro Rupert won't mind me saying, uh, is actually my husband, who is the keenest cyclist we could ever imagine. And he likes to tell me exactly what I need to be doing and how quickly I need to be doing it. Uh, most evenings on our uh, conversation between Westminster and Bootle. And I myself, uh, I was a keen mountain biker. Well, when I say keen, very amateur. I live in the Lake District National Park and loved getting out and about on my mountain bike until my specialised 
dump jumper, I think it was, was nicked out the back of my car when I was about 20 years old. And since then, it's been more around cycling with children. I taught my own four daughters to ride their bikes. And I also taught bike ability when I was a school governor, which was the most terrifying thing. If anybody's on the call, teaching young children how to ride safely on a highway then hats off to you because I found it really rather terrifying everybody survived actually everybody passed and it really made me realize the importance of bikeability and you know I'm so keen to support that uh, I think we have just over 60 percent of schools now involved with bikeability I would definitely like to get that up but the most important thing is you know making sure that we've got the infrastructure as well so children and and women and and, and the, the fact that cycling can be life-changing for disabled people they're three key priorities for me i know we have this commitment on towns and villages already but i do want to roll that out to uh, sorry on towns and cities but i do want to roll that out to villages as well uh, not least because i live in a village and we've got terrible cycling infrastructure um you know for me to get to a train station it's a 60 mile an hour road with no road markings and we are not part of sustran cycle network route 72 in my community so part of me accepting this role is just actually wanting to understand where the money is coming from and how i can assist my own council my own community in improving the cycle infrastructure because i know that it makes such a difference to have that segregated designated route for people so that was a very kind of selfish interest uh, to improve the cycling infrastructure in my own community. But in terms of you know, what we're doing with Active Travel England, I think I've probably set out there what Active Travel is and who it's currently headed up by. We anticipate that the headquarters will be uh, in York and we're setting up the board and really understanding what the, the roles and responsibilities will be. Um, significant uh, funding is attached. It's about 1.3 billion from Department for Transport, about 600 and something um, million from the previous 20 to 2022. And then a 710, I think was announced. I'm sure Rupert will pull me if I get this wrong. 710 in the more recent uh, spending review. And then in addition, uh, the leveling up budget that sits with uh, Department for Leveling Up Homes and Communities is also funding some significant cycle projects. The key thing is that we want to ensure cycling projects that this government funds are fit for purpose. And that's why we've set out um, our um, local transport notice, LTN 120, and we're quite strict on that. So councils, local authorities looking to roll out infrastructure will have to adhere to LTN 120 um, now and in the future if they want to secure government funding. And I've seen for myself in my own county of Cumbria, some pretty poor cycle so-called infrastructure. A white line on a road does not constitute a cycle route. That rhymes, wasn't intended to. It's just the reality of what I've seen in and around Cumbria. It's not about aesthetics. It's about infrastructure being fit for purpose. And that is very much what Active Travel England are developing. Um, it's not just good for you know, the environment, it's really good for health. So we're working with practitioners to, you know, instead of administering pills and potions, Think about a bike ride. Think about how we can enable more people to either hire electric bikes or conventional uh, push bikes or, you know, the, the higher schemes that we've seen rolled out in Cornwall. Currently thinking just how we can encourage more people to cycle um, who maybe haven't considered it before, who maybe really would benefit from the improvements in mental health and physical well-being that comes from cycling. They're all well documented. They feature throughout our brilliant gear change policy and in the transport decarbonisation plan, which I was really fortunate. I walked into the Department for Transport with a ready-made plan um, which covers 
all the modes of transport, all the vehicles, what we want to achieve, our ambition. And now it's really about putting the flesh on the bones of how we're going to do that. And I'm sure on this call, we have a wealth of people who are already working in that um, sector at the moment, either for personal reasons or professional reasons, really want to see us, this government, roll out an incredible cycling revolution. And um, with that, I will turn to Rupert to remind me of all the things I was supposed to say that didn't. I uh, know that in the brief, it was talking about the brilliant cycling infrastructure in the Lake District. And we do have fantastic cycling infrastructure at Grisdale Forest and Winlatter Forest, particularly for leisure cycling. But I couldn't possibly read that out about my own community. And prior to being a member of parliament, I'd worked on schemes as a regeneration officer and also as a parish councillor. It's plum and hard work. Firstly, to get an agreement in a local community on a route, you know, pedestrian, equestrian, cyclist, you've got to work with all of these um, user groups and then to secure the land. That's not easy. So I'm really working closely with Victoria Prentice on how we can um, work with farmers and other landowners to make it worth their while to support cycling infrastructure, new cycling routes, improved cycling routes. And then after that comes the money. That's not easy either. So, you know, I've experienced this for the last 15 years as a volunteer, as a parish councillor, as a school governor, as a developer working for um, housing uh, projects, and then also as a regeneration officer working for my local council. And when I undertook my degree in sustainable communities, a module that I chose to do was about sustainable transport, all about cycling. This was back in 2010. And I studied the Netherlands and um, Northern European countries and just thought, how do they do it? The weather isn't that much better. Okay, it's a lot flatter in some areas compared to the Lake District but how do they do it? And it's a cultural change that we need to make. And I'm looking forward to actually visiting um, the Netherlands and um, Holland, Denmark to understand what is it in those communities in terms of how we encourage children, how parents use bikes, the different kinds of bikes that are available. I'm just learning about e-cargo bikes, incredible. But our infrastructure has been designed not to allow e-cargo bikes to get through the bollards or the, the various barriers that we put up. So um, that will be a really interesting visit. And um, I know we've come such a long way, you know, since the Olympics, um, all of the uh, high profile people, I think that we have to thank the influencers, not least Chris himself, um, but the influencers who've enticed people to take to two wheels or three wheels. I don't think many people are on one wheel, but there's definitely a whole raft of different bikes in different shapes and sizes. There's a bike for everyone, everywhere. And it should be perfectly possible to cycle everywhere right across the country. That is clearly what the Prime Minister wants us to achieve. That is what gear change wants us to achieve. And I'm looking forward to being part of the team that makes it a little bit more possible. Thank you very much, Zelaine. And um, can I just ask Rupert to pick up on the bits that I've forgotten to mention? Yeah, well, I think you've covered it all very well, Minister, although I'm gutted to hear that you listen to your husband uh, more than you listen to, to me. Uh, my wife would be very uh, impressed because she always feels that I don't listen to her anything like uh, enough. Um, uh, on uh, one-wheelers, by the way, uh, we often have letters about whether unicycles should be eligible for the Cycle to Work scheme discount, but that's another matter which I... Uh, won't go into for now. Um, I think the only things I would emphasise, I mean, Active Travel England is going to be a real game changer, um, uh, and, you know, a real transformation in the way that we do um, active travel uh, with a huge new focus on the quality, as you've mentioned, Minister, just making sure that we are um, no longer delivering uh, those poor quality cycle lanes of which there were far too many in the past. Um, it's also a big agenda for us around uh, walking and making sure that we're making our town centres uh, particularly uh, more walkable. Um, uh, since when you mentioned the 
uh, the, the, the aim to get half of all journeys in towns and cities walked or cycled by 2030. Re realistically, it's the it's the walking which is going to be doing the, the heavy lifting on that. So I know there's a big agenda around uh, getting more walking uh, underway. Uh, but other than that, Minister, I think, yeah, you, you've, you've um, covered it all uh, very well. So perhaps we should now hand back to Selene, I think, who's going to perhaps uh, take us through some of the Q&A. Yes, indeed. Thanks very much, Rupert um, and Judy. Lovely to hear from you both. Um, and as always, this APPG does answer the questions that <laughs> nobody else is asking on cycling or walking. So expect some tricky ones coming in. Um, but the first one is, how is the department actually working um, to actually get to children who, where bikeability is obviously not on the curriculum? How are we actually working with other departments to ensure that no children are left behind? So places like Department of Education, DCMS, Health and Deluxe to promote active travel. Yeah, this is actually a really good question. I'm going to ask Rupert how we currently engage because it's a key priority for me. I think I'm right in saying about 60% of um, schools are currently engaged with um, bikeability. I think that's predominantly primary schools. But in terms of how we engage with the Department for Education, you know, th there will be calls, I'm sure, for this to become part of the national curriculum. Um, but Rupert, could you just um, add some further detail on what we're specifically doing there? Any plans for the future? Well, on and, the specific... uh, is it about twenty-five million that we've recently committed to bikeability? We will be putting um, well twenty million into bikeability uh, this year, um, and of course, there's a manifesto commitment to offer uh, bikeability training to all school children by the end of the parliament. I mean, on the general point about how we work um, across government, um, certainly at official level, we have very regular uh, dialogue with our colleagues, whether it's in the Department for Education around bikeability or the Department for Health and Social Care uh, around um, the sort of physical and mental health benefits. Um, so there's quite a well-established network of cross-government um, uh, close working together uh, on, on various issues. I mean, there's always more that we could do, of course. Um, um, and I'm sure, Minister, you also have conversations so that with your counterparts from other um, departments. Um, uh, so it's certainly an area where I think there's an awful lot of joined up action, but that's not to say that we can't perhaps do more on that. I don't know, Minister, whether you feel that you, you know, how often you see your counterparts from education and health and elsewhere? for me is I mean we have bikeability but um, in, in, in my case in my own school a tiny little village school I think we probably had about 20 children in the whole school at that time and it was just not possible to find anybody who was um, you know sufficiently trained and willing to teach our children and that is why I you know very quickly underwent the training and did it myself I was the chair of governors at the time I thought it was really really important and uh, as my old dad would say if a job needs done do it yourself and I, I think that is probably a barrier so perhaps Rupert it would be helpful to um, assess why it isn't 100% of schools? What are the main barriers uh, yeah. to those schools actually not being able to take advantage? Um, you know, it's practical things like being able to hire the bikes if the children don't have them. It's, it's making parents uh, see the benefits of their children being able to undertake bikeability. I remember when my own girls did it, all four of my daughters also did um, bikeability and I myself did cycling proficiency, it was, it was called back then. But it was a bit of a faff to get the girls bikes into school. Um, I remember we did it, but it could certainly be a barrier for people who live far enough away. So their child maybe gets public transport to school so they can't cycle in. But if you don't own a car, it's not easy to get the bike into the school. So just assessing some of those practical barriers, I think, would be really worthwhile and yeah. doing our level best to bust them. Uh, and I think we're well aware that there's a shortage of instructors nationally, so we're providing some bursary funding so that people can more easily qualify to become bikeability instructors, as well as looking at questions like how we do make bikes available where uh, it's harder for the kids to uh, bring them into school. Mm -hmm. But I'm conscious, sorry, we're only on our first question, aren't we, um, Selene? So I don't know whether you want to steer us on to 
Well, I've been Another asked to, to, finish, to do one more on bikeability um, while we're on the topic before moving on. So the Department for Transport has invested 20 million to provide free bikeability training for every child outside of London, which Carolyn Axtell, whose question this is, warmly welcomes. Um, is it fair that cycle training in London relies on income from TfL fares, jeopardising the chance of children and adults to learn this important life skill in contrast to the rest of the nation's children? Do you want I will have to take that away, Celine, because I don't know the detail on that. Unless, Rupert, can you provide more information on um, the eligibility of London schools to... Yeah, it's, it's certainly been the case, as, as the questioner points out, that traditionally we've not funded cycle training in London because TfL has generally been able to um, stand on its own two feet, if you like, and as the question says, uh, use income from the fare box and elsewhere but of course we are in very different times uh, at the moment and we've been having some dialogue with TfL in recent days um, about the possibility of us uh, 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 potentially giving some help to enable more cycle training to take place in London but of course that will have to be looked at in the context of the wider discussions around future TfL settlements so it's it's kind of wrapped up in that bigger question. Lovely thank you very much and so moving on and it's, it's great for me I'm um, often on this call because Ruth is obviously based in London um, and uh, many of the other cycling initiatives have obviously come out of our cities so it's great for me that the minister is also rural um, so some of the challenges that we face are a bit different and I think I'd just like to put that caveat ahead of the next question I don't know who's asked um, but because I think some of the solutions um, aren't active travel when it comes to getting around as Trudy just said you can't always get there on your bike with best will in the world um, so apparently the treasury is going to have a massive windfall in taxes due to the um, record fuel prices this year alone. And um, so the question wants to know, will you be pressing, Trudy, for some of the tax money to be redirected towards greater levels of investment in the active travel budget? Well, uh, matters for of the Treasury are really up to the Chancellor. But um, of course, we will be, um, I mean, I, I can't, you know, not repeat that we have about six times the amount of funding that you know we've ever had for cycling so the commitment to spend two billion pounds is absolutely fantastic um and i think it's also worth saying that cyclists also use roads although one of the my husband's frequent whinges is about roads in our area are often chipped and he really hates it when the roads have recently been resurfaced but um, I, I think it's also important that the roads budget and money that is being spent on transport more generally looks at the way we design roads with a cycling and walking lens wherever possible. So that's a really important factor. And I know that Active Travel England will be involved with that as well. So um, I think many people use roads, not just car drivers. And um, seeing how we design infrastructure, whether it's roads or cycleways, with that lens is the most important thing. Rupert, do you want to add anything on that? Um, no, I think you've, you've covered it. I mean, uh, obviously, you know, all revenue from fuel duties goes into the general exchequer reserves, which helps pay for all um, of the government's priorities, including the uh, money that's invested in active travel. So, um, um, you know, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it, it is already the case that, uh, that, that that money is paying for our active travel investment. Lovely. Thank you. Um, and so, Minister, what are your top three new active travel corridors, either planned, under construction or recently opened? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I have to say my top one is finding a way to cross the River Esk in my own community, selfishly. But we're making decisions on the, um, you know, the, the cycling schemes um, now, actually. We should have some news in the, uh, the next few weeks on um, which, which local authorities have been successful in our various schemes. We've got the Mini Holland scheme. We've also got uh, a, a particular fund with local authorities as well. Um, new funds coming down the line. I am going to turn to Rupert again, but my priority is about um, women feeling safe and able to cycle more because we've got more work to do there. And sometimes it's about the perception 
we've just recently had our violence against women um, recommendations from our safety champions, particularly for transport. And um, whilst that predominantly focuses on public transport, I think it is really important that more women who disproportionately will spend a lot of the time caring for children, even today, often make those decisions. And I've seen this for myself, you know, as I said, I uh, taught my daughters to ride their bikes along with my husband, but I have for many, many times pleaded with them not to go out on their bikes because I've been worried about their safety. And, you know, that can't continue. That's something that I really want to change. I would like, you know, children to be able to cycle to school, to walk and to cycle to school. We're talking about side road zebras for enabling easier walking routes to school, particularly primary schools. And I would certainly like to see a focus on the areas from, you know, homes within a couple of miles to primary schools as well. Because I think if children can establish those healthy and safe routines in the first 11 years of the life, or probably more from age seven or eight until 11, that really will put them in the best possible situation to look to walking and cycling um, in their adulthood as well. So that's a key area for me, enabling children and women to get on a bike. Excellent. Thank you. No, I agree entirely. Um, and do you have any ideas um, when the Active Travel Fund 4 funding will be announced um, on, and Active Travel Fund 3, actually, 3 and 4? Do you have any details of, of when the timings on those new funds are coming through, please? Uh, in the spring. Is that as close as I can be? Um, it started yesterday, the spring. <laughs> we haven't finished it yet, though, Selene. Excellent. OK. Good. Well, now spring started. It's well underway. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure the Chancellor has an impact on that as well. Um, uh, where will the Department for Transport formally notify councils outside of London of the approval to use ANPR cameras? Do you know what? We've got this in the um, brief. Rupert, what's the answer to that? So this is all about part six of the Traffic Management Act, isn't it? And when, when those powers are going to be brought, uh, are going to be enacted. Um, I think the short answer is it's likely to be the summer, I think, because I think the, um, there are various statutory, statutory instruments that need to go through Parliament. Um, uh, and I think we're hoping, therefore, that by the early summer, those powers will be available to local yeah. authorities. Sorry to give you these vague timelines. They are not all within our control, as Selene will know, and Ruth. The parliamentary <laughs> um, calendar is not always, um, you know, able to accommodate all of our wishes and demands. But we will be, um, you know, you'll be hearing about it in Parliament, certainly, ladies. Um, and whilst I've got the chair and we're talking about enforcement, having almost been run over by a cyclist with my dog this morning that rode through a red light, um, I am actually also quite concerned about the pedestrians' use of the new cycle path outside of Westminster, crossing that bridge, to have their photograph taken by Big Ben. And it is only a matter of time before a cyclist and a pedestrian have quite a serious accident there. I don't know if you've seen it, Ruth, but the speed that they're able to get up over the bridge on their bikes and pedestrians just randomly crossing. Are there any plans to sort of enforce education of our active travellers be they cyclists or walkers actually in those sort of environments where you've got a new cycle path but clearly pedestrians are ignoring the fact it is designated for cyclists. Well the, the highway code you will I'm sure be aware um, was amended and most recently amended on the 29th of January. Rupert point me in the right direction if I've, I've got that wrong um, but um, so that, that's kind of set out the hierarchy and how we would expect um, people to essentially take care for each other and that kind of vulnerability hierarchy. In terms of increasing penalties, I think that's coming out on the tw 25th of March. That's this week, isn't it? Is that, are we still on course for that, Rupert? Um, that's, um, you know, death by dangerous driving, I think is increasing from four years to life, we're increasing um, two year, from two years to five years, other driving penalties. And the THINK campaign is the, the big programme that the department has to improve um, 
you know, people's knowledge and consideration and uh, guarding against irresponsible, whether it's cycling, driving or whatever. Um, that is an ongoing campaign, as is rolling out the highway code cha changes. No, it's an ongoing campaign um, with the department. But something I am actually keen to ask members about is I feel that um, sometimes an unhealthy kind of divide has been created between cyclists and motorists. And the reality is that many motorists are always often cyclists and many cyclists are often motorists and ultimately we're just people trying to get to the places we need to be or have the products delivered to our homes and businesses and I would very much like to dial down that divide and recognize the value of cycling for health for environmental for reducing congestion for our economy I mean it's a really significant um, you know income generator about five and a half billion pounds, thousands of jobs, 60 something thousand jobs are in the cycling sector. So it's so important. And I would welcome the views and opinions from members on language, perhaps the communications, the ways in which we can um, dial down that divide. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, Selene and Ruth. I'm noticing increasingly, I know my husband talks about this, he certainly has faced um, animosity and his fellow, you know, colleagues going to work have faced that kind of animosity. It just does not seem fair. It's absolutely not right. I'm sure it goes both ways, but somehow we need to find a way through this. And I am very, very keen to be part of the team that improves the way in which we get about. Fantastic, thank you, Minister. So this is quite a technical question coming up next. Um, the Highways Maintenance and Integrated Transport Block Funding Formula allocations that were announced on the 28th of February were based on a formula that apparently hasn't been updated since 2013 and is based entirely on road lengths with 0% for cycle and footway lengths. Councils with longer lengths of these will not get any added funding, which will obviously affect urban areas in particular. Can this be looked at, please, so future funding rounds post-2025 can reflect the increased importance given to cycling and walking? Yes, I am very happy to have a look at that. And indeed, all of the ways that, you know, our methodology um, measures the cost benefit for cycling. It's part of what, why we've got a department for levelling up. It's not right that population is always the uh, the kind of the most important metric when we decide where funding goes. And nor is um, the number of fatalities and serious accidents. It should also be about those near misses and it should be about potential as well. So we'll be looking at all of that and we'll have Active Travel England giving it um, their attention because this is a transport revolution. It's not just about decarbonisation, it's about equality, inclusiveness, and making sure that everybody can access our transport system in all its modes. Lovely. I mean, Rupert. Yeah. Rupert. What, one thing to add to that is I think we did look at including uh, footway lengths and cycleway lengths in this formula. Uh, last time it was looked at which as you say was um, seven or eight years ago now but the one problem is that we just don't have the data we just don't have robust national or even local level data on how many miles of cycle track there are and exactly how many miles of um, uh, pavements and so on so what one issue is the data um, uh, and we are commissioning some work to get much better quality data so that so that we can look at look at this question again about whether we can use uh, cycleway and uh, pay of footway lengths as part of this formula in future um, uh, so uh, yeah so I think that that is a, po a point worth making so we've got we've got some research that we're about to commission which will which will help us to get to the bottom of this a bit more thank you and um, thank you to the MPs that have joined the call this afternoon unfortunately Matt Weston's had to pop off but Darren Henry did have a question and Darren asked does the department have any upcoming pilot studies that the department are looking towards um, obviously the ministers mentioned encouraging cycling to school do you have any other thoughts on how we can make this happen potentially more school streets which have had a big success within London 
Yeah, uh, Darren actually wrote to me and I and when I wrote back, uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, Darren, I mentioned that um, I would set up a meeting. And I know that is happening. I think it would be helpful for MPs that are part of the APPG to perhaps have a, a, a get together with myself and Active Travel England to see how as parliamentarians, they can best support their constituencies because um, it's complicated. I think every MP has got some cycle scheme or other that they really want to see happen. And I think that would be really useful, Rupert, actually, to, to um, arrange that get together, probably virtual, so that we can directly support parliamentarians um, with the, you know, um, it, I think it's really timely as we create Active Travel England um, to, to know how best to support our local authorities because they are key partners. Mm. We all know the work of our councils and our um, highways authorities. And also in my case, I've got the Lake District National Park who have the responsibility for um, you know, certain routes as well, bridleways in particular. So I think that focus and maybe the APPG might like to coordinate that um, would be really helpful. That sounds great, Minister. I'm sure the APPG would love to. Ruth's desperate to ask a question. Matt oh, Weston Ruth. also wanted to come to a meeting, so he'll be delighted as well. So, yes, I'm very happy to help liaise on that. Ruth. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Selena, and thank you, uh, Trudy, for your enthusiasm and, and, and your support for the principles of what we're, uh, you know, we want to achieve. And, and thank you to Rupert as well. Um, my question is... Um, about the 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 the, the sucker and see and the uh, the funding for amendments to schemes. So um, Hounslow uh, in West London uh, uh, used the uh, emergency COVID uh, funding uh, very effectively and very well, and introduced a lot of um, uh, schemes to reduce to, to basically cut out rat running, which has been the bane of residents' lives, particularly since sat navs became the norm for vehicle drivers. Uh, some of the schemes have been, as I say, demanded for residents for some time. Some of them had become quite, um, you know, uh, uh, residential roads being traffic jams um, for much of the working week, um, particularly the morning and evening peak. So, but the, but the ones um, that have worked particularly well, I mean, the vast majority of the schemes have are very simple uh, and uh, Hounslow's used ANPR uh, cameras rather than physical barriers as much as possible, which helps so that people living within the schemes don't feel trapped the, the wrong side of the barrier. So that's worked well. But the, the 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 big scheme, the big area is Chiswick, and it's it's large and it's complex, but it has always suffered from long distance through traffic, trying to avoid the uh, snarl up that is the Hogarth roundabout on the A4 and the Great Chertsey Road A316, where it comes in from. Richmond. So, so, you know, so uh, through tra traffic filters through that area. And since the scheme's been put in, it's taken about eight to 10,000 vehicles away from the neighbourhood. That's great. It's achieved a uh, drop in pollution, uh, um, uh, RT, uh, RTIs, um, uh, and so on, and made life much more pleasant for people living uh, in the area. The problem is the complexity of it. And what Hounslow really needs is to is to be able to try different ways because you know you try they've tried something and there's been unintended consequences, so they put another variation in. But it has meant there are sort of it's complicated. There are different rules depending on where you live and that sort of thing. And I think it would really help if they could be supported to keep on trying different schemes until one works to the best effect. Now, will the department consider that? Because, um, you know, they've used the funding very effectively, but um, as I say, with a complex scheme, it's not easy to solve straight away um, because one doesn't quite know what the impact will be in a complex scheme. That's my question. Yeah, um, I'm going to let uh, Rupert speak to the detail of this, but I know, you know, in the in the gear change strategy, there's a, a clear um, kind of suggestion there to trial, to not necessarily 
put uh, very expensive materials um, in place if we don't have the confidence that it will be accepted locally. Because, because part of what we're doing here is a culture change for many people. People who've been perhaps reliant on a car who perhaps think they're the only old, you know, the only way to get about is with the car may need a bit of a nudge. And so therefore, that is why that kind of trial um, is recommended in the, the gear change strategy. The, the specifics of what you're saying, I'm afraid I don't know the area, Ruth, but in terms of our policy going forward, Rupert, do you want to just explain a little bit more um, how we're getting around this? Because I think yeah. what Ruth's um, explaining is a challenge that most local authorities are facing and, and we want to bring people with us. What we absolutely do not want to do is create an even bigger divide. Yeah. You know, we want people to appreciate the benefits of cycling for their health, for their children's health, for congestion, for air pollution, and for just general happiness, health and enjoyment. And bringing people with us is absolutely vital. And I hope Rupert will get yeah. that message loud and clear. <laughs> I'm certainly hearing hearing it loud and clear. But yeah, I mean, as as Ruth says, it, it is complicated. I mean, th this stuff is blooming difficult. Um, and I think one of the um, challenges we saw at the start of the lockdown was that um, the department encouraged authorities to kind of rush into things very, very quickly, um, which meant that a number of schemes went in that, that weren't quite right. And I think, therefore, ever since then, we've emphasised the importance of proper engagement with local communities. Um, I think we'd now rather local authorities took the time to get these things right. Um, I mean, of course, not everything will work absolutely perfectly first time. And um, it is right that our, our guidance encourages local authorities to, to use some of the measures available to them, whether that's temporary traffic regulation orders or emergency traffic regulation orders. There are different ways in which they can experiment. But I think the key thing is, yes, to, to engage properly with local people, local businesses, um, disabled stakeholders, uh, all of the other wide range of people who will all have very strong views on these on these schemes. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably the, the, uh, the, the key message to emphasize is the need for proper engagement and consideration. And in terms of specific funds going forward for Ruth's area, do you want to write to me, Ruth, and then I can look in more detail with the team um you know suitable funds coming forward and you know ways to shape and um bring about how we will fund because you know that uh, 710 million uh, pounds from the spending review is you know still being considered the best ways to to roll that out um what we don't want to do is perhaps a northern phrase but be spread too thin it's very ineffective we do want to see some really good examples of well thought through infrastructure, um, which sometimes costs more uh, using materials that will stand the test of time. But I think that's the right way to approach things. And um, working with our partners, SUSTRANS is an organization that I worked closely with when I was a regeneration officer in the council. I think the SUSTRANS National Network is absolutely brilliant. I love seeing those blue signs all around the countryside. Um, but sometimes those um, routes have been installed with materials that weren't designed for longevity. They were designed when, you know, finances were tight and we just had to put something in. Now we're really looking and, and trying to ensure that there's quality in routes have been thought through, materials uh, yeah. built to last, and things are fit for purpose, not just um, kind of vanity projects. It needs to have sanity, not just vanity. Very nice strap line. Um, I know that we're now a bit tight on time, so I'm just going to leave you with a parting thought, Trudy, while you're spending your money. Um, there has been a suggestion that marking and registration is an inexpensive and highly effective way to deter death of bicycles. And so might more funding be made available for this important intervention to keep people literally on their bikes? And, and um, <laughs> did you want to say anything quickly, Trudy, before I had a day? I was just thinking, oh, how I wish I marked up my uh, mountain bike when I was... 20 years old I think uh, I'm not sure whether it would have made a difference but you know it was nicked out of the back of my locked car they left my Ford Escort 1.3 um, B but uh, took my mountain bike
I, lost I think the short answer, well. uh, yeah, well, indeed, my, my daughter had her bike nicked in Cambridge the other day as well. So it's close, a subject close to my own heart. But the short answer is that we are working with the British Transport Police and others to kind of consolidate the various cycle registers that are out there and to make it easier for police forces, therefore, to trace the owners of stolen bikes. So there is work underway uh, on that one, mm -hmm. as promised in gear change. But in the interest of time, I'd better, I'd better stop there and hand pack to the chair. Yeah, and, and we should also, you know, just make clear that this is a really, really important um, matter because people are investing an awful lot of money in bikes now. I know that because a large proportion of my salary seems to go on my husband's bike collection and they're not cheap. And, and also, as more and more people are relying on bikes, as we want them to, for their you know, most important mode of transport, it is vital. There may be cargo bikes that are absolutely essential to their um, work as well. So we do work with the Home Office to look at ways in which we can secure these essential vehicles that uh, we want more and more people to be using to get about and to move products as well. So e-cargo bikes are something that we're particularly keen on. Thank you very much, Minister. And I'm going to hand over to Ruth um, to wrap up our meeting. So thank you so much for coming and answering all these questions. Ruth, over to you. Um, sorry, yes, right. OK, uh, thank you very much, uh, Trudy. Um, I say that, that, that was really helpful and, and thank you for your support um, and obviously we will be feeding you specific questions um, that you and, and Rupert and team will, will answer. I mean obviously uh, I wasn't able to attend the last meeting but you know it, it's such a good step forward to see that our active travel England is, is now a reality. Um, I, I was uh, working for Sustrans in, in, in the um, in the noughties and uh, you know with uh, with um, site, what was it called? I can't remember what it was called, but the, it's the predecessor of Active Travel England that was sadly uh, disappeared with the bonfire of the Quangos in, in 2010. But, um, you know, so it's good to see that we have it back. You know, I think many of the, the questions and concerns that we and, and our members have is around um, the, the commitment to law change where, where needed and um, pavement parking often comes up and not just with this APPG, um, but also sufficient funding and whether it's new funding from the Treasury or from other government departments like education, or whether it's maybe a little bit of veering from within the very large, um, oops, sorry, uh, very large um, uh, transport department budget and particularly um, implementing schemes that support walking and cycling at the initiation of schemes, whether it be a new rail link or a junction improvement um, that, that DFT stroke um, uh, oh, Highways England or whatever it's called this year. Um, uh, National Highways. Has, you know, National Highways, thank you. <laughs> um, but, you know, think, thinking active travel and safe active travel along and across routes at the initiation and also, as one of the people posted in the Q&A, thinking about the beginning and end of journey, um, the route into a station or a, or a bus, um, bus garage, the, the, where one can safely uh, uh, lock um, bikes or hire bikes and that sort of thing. It, you know, pe people on the whole are not cyclists. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, as others will know, I don't like being called a keen cyclist. Actually, I don't cycle all that often but it's my utility form of transport in outer London because it's usually quicker than getting the car out um, and you know that's what it is in the Netherlands and in Denmark and in many European cities it's the natural form of transport for many people for many of their journeys not all people are not all of their journeys um, but the more that one can shift out of the car the more one frees up space for um, those that those journeys or for those people that don't have a choice so that's what we're about and obviously walking as well and it's remarkable how far you can get in a 10 minute or 15 minute walk so um I think that's all um thank yeah, I, you think, very much. I think you're right there Ruth I think also you know encouraging employers to provide shower facilities and mm. it's all really thinking about what are the barriers for people having safe storage at home confidence that they can um, cycle to their destination, confidence that they can secure the bike when they get to that destination, freshen up if needs be, although with an electric bike, 
uh, not too much to worry about there. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's it's not just the cycle route. It is a much more holistic. And as a mother of four, you know, I'm amazed at these new bikes that enable you to carry your children. I've been really impressed at what the options are in Copenhagen for carrying children, much more than just a, a trailer at the back, which is what I had. Yeah, well, we, we've got quite we've got those in, in, in Chiswick and, um, you know, we've got we've got companies in London that do stall runs uh, and, uh, during, and and then during the day, their cargo bikes. So, um, you know, the, 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 we're, we're seeing a lot more of that. And, you know, to be fair, the, the, uh, the government has supported grants yep. for, for cargo bikes for, for, for businesses. So that's that's really welcome. But we are, you know. We are still a bit behind the trend from, from some of our competitor countries, and it's worth looking at those, particularly grants for bu buying e-bikes, which has uh, kick-started a revolution in, in e-bike ownership and also brought prices down because it... it yeah, it, we are looking at that. Yeah, yeah building yeah. on what was achieved at Cornwall and continues to be achieved, we are looking at how we can how we can do that. Anyway, I, I bet we, we better stop talking. Um, Adam, do we... Uh, we've got a... Um, another meeting the next meeting we can tell everybody about yeah the next meeting is on monday the 25th of april at 5 p.m it's seamless me and Ruth. We're, we're, <laughs> we're 5, PM, 5 PM on monday the 25th of april and we are going to be doing exactly what we've suggested and looking at other countries for their active travel proposals from scotland and wales and i will also make sure that we get a date in the diary for mps to meet again with the minister and her team that would be fantastic thank you very much thank you to everyone who's joined thank you, thank you ruth as always thank you adam for all your hard work in the background and making this happen um and minister thank you so much much and Rupert for coming along this afternoon. Lovely to have you all here. Take care, Thank everybody. You. Thanks for all your work.